James chapter 1, if I pray you are turned there. We're going to be here for a little while. Uh, we're in our new sermon series here. We're going to be going through the book of James. Hallelujah. Um, parents, and if you are uh, parents, parents, here's what I need. Um, I need y'all to uh, bring your kids next Sunday. Because uh, only, only uh, Joe and Aiden are here. And I'm going to pray for y'all, but I want to pray for all of our children and all of our students before they go to school. Uh, Amy, you got school this Friday? You just, yes or no? Yeah. Joe, uh, does she have school this Friday? Tuesday? Uh, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So uh, we want to be, we want to be praying. I want y'all to bring your, bring your kids. Amen. Amen. Bring your kids. Uh, because we want to we want to put a, a pray the blessing of the Lord over their lives Amen. Not just for protection, but for everything else Amen. So so we want I need y'all to bring y'all children. Amen. James chapter 1 verse 1 if you have it say amen, amen. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to get right into it Father I need you as I always do and I'll never get up here and act like I can uh, I can preach without you because I can't. I can't lead without you. I can't do anything without you. And so, Father, now I pray in the name of Jesus. Give me grace to preach your word. God, uh, would you shut the mouth of the devil even now? Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Any words of distraction, anything that will hinder anybody in here from hearing what you have to say, Father. I pray remove all distractions, remove all uh, lingering thoughts, God, so that we can hear what you have to say. And Father, I pray be with me, give me clarity of thought, concision of speech, and conviction of heart to preach your word. Give me strength, God. And I pray now, Holy Spirit, have your way. Christian is sitting down, you stand up. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Give me grace, God. Hallelujah. And Lord, I pray anything you have me to say, bring it to mind by your Holy Spirit. Anything you don't have me to say, remove it from my mind. But let your people be edified, sanctified, as you are glorified. We love you, we thank you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. Amen. James chapter 1, verse 1. You can leave it right there because that's all as far as we're going. And it reads like this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion greetings. I read, that's the uh, reading of God's word. And I want to preach from these words. I need you to bear with me because I got a lot to explain. But I want to preach from these words. I'm in the dispersion. I'm in the dispersion. And bear with me. I promise there is a reason behind all that. If you walk with me a little while, I'll get you there. Amen. I need your prayers. Here we go. I'm in the dispersion. <clears throat> I was 19 years old, Brother Nate. Uh, in between, uh, in winter session, winter recess, if you will, uh, between uh, uh, college uh, semesters. And as a college student, you know that after, while you are in college, you are just universally broke. It's Jess, I don't know, a part of me feels like it comes with the, like, it's on the application. Prepare to be broke for the next four years of your life. So I don't have any money, and my mama said, you, you, it's okay, that's normal. Uh, but I needed a job in between, because I had about a month, and I needed, wanted to do some things, but I didn't have no money to do it. And so, um, at this point in time, me and my family were doing some marriage, and we ran into Target. And then on the, uh, on the door, it said two words that I was so delighted to see, now hiring. I said, yes, yes, please. So I walked in, I said, what's the worst that can happen? I don't get the job. Well, believe it or not, I actually got the job. I was 19 years old, my mom was like, wow, that happened really fast. And I was excited. They said, when can you start? I said, I can start tomorrow. They said, fantastic. So I'm happy. I'm in my red shirt. I ain't get a name tag yet. We ain't get to that status. But I'm in a red shirt. I'm in my tan khaki pants. Y'all know how it is at Target. And I said, all right, I'm ready to, you know, I'm ready to move some stuff. I'm ready to put products on the shelves. And they said, no, not yet. They said, uh, we need you to come into this room. And so I walked into this room and there were other people that were there. And they slid in this TV. And they said, you're going to be sitting in here for the next three hours 
and watch a tutorial on how to work at Target. When I tell you that was, that was the longest three hours of my life to learn how to work at Target. Those are three hours I will never get back. But for three hours, they taught us the safety features. They taught you what to do when you need to buy a product, when you need to get the lift to get uh, to get a product. It was very informative, but Pastor got a little bit of ADHD. It takes him about five minutes before he get bored. I was done by minute five. It was over. And the book of James <laughs> kind of serves as a practical tutorial on how to live as a Christian. My prayer is that I don't bore you and I'm not going to be three hours. But the book of James is a, is a tutorial on how to live as a Christian. Many scholars have said that the book of James is the Proverbs of the New Testament. Because of the practical wisdom that James gives throughout the letter. Now we understand that the whole Bible is the blueprint on life, right? Amen? The Bible is filled with doctrine and narratives that teach us lessons that we need and must apply. However, James kind of gets right to the point of the matter uh, in this letter and gives us concrete instructions on how to live. Now, I offer a caution this series in the book of James uh, because this series will not be of any benefit to you, really just like any series, but this series in particular, it won't be of any benefit to you if you do not apply the word to your life. Say it again. This series will not be of any benefit to you until it applies to your life. Uh, I've heard preachers and scholars say, and it's true, that the Bible is the only book that you can read that starts reading you. Uh, when you read the Bible, it can serve as a mirror. It, it, it makes us look at ourselves and reveal to us where we are pleasing to the Lord and where we need to repent and grow. As with this sermon series, I want you to treat this sermon series as a mirror. See the similarities between James's audience and us. See the similarities between the way we live and the way they live. The circumstances they dealt with and the circumstances we deal with. Like a mirror, see yourself in this book and apply the word to your situation to see how God wants you to live your life. Amen? Now, in order to see the similarities, we need to know the similarities. In order to know, to see the circumstances, we need to know the circumstances. So what we're going to do is we're, we're going to get into the dispersion. Put our feet in their sandals. Put on their tunics. Walk the, the dirt roads they walk. And as we walk through the first verse and eventually this letter, we will see ourselves. Well, Pastor, what, what are we supposed to see? Here it is, verse 1. First thing that James shows us is who we are. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love how James writes the greeting portion of this letter to the Jews in this forum. Let me tell you a little bit about the person we're going to be reading about. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus. Now remember, this, this, he's the half-brother of Jesus. And, and, and mind you, I'm not talking about a brother in the Lord. I'm not talking about through the, uh, through the cross. Jesus got the same mom. Same mom. Different dad, same mama. How ironic is that? Same, same, same mom. And 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 now James is getting ready to write to the people in the diaspora. I'm going to explain that in a minute. But that word diaspora, it means scattered seed. I'm going to get to all that in a minute. Just stay with me. But James is the half-brother of Jesus, and he's writing to the churches in the diaspora, and he says, Hey, uh, uh, I'm give you some encouragement and admonishment, but as he writes the letter, he introduces himself as uh, James, a servant of God. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. If I was if I was him, and y'all pray for passing, but, but if I was him, and I knew, and, and they knew that, James, that Jesus was my brother, I, I'm not going to write servant of God. I'm going to write James, the brother of Jesus. I, 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 and then write a little resume. I uh, wore his clothes. I got his hand-me-downs. I done brushed teeth with him, right? We did chores together, right? We argued a little bit. Like, like, I would put all that down so that it will show and give credibility to the people I'm writing to, but they, that's not what James does. James says, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, introduce myself that way. I'm not going to use, uh, drop any names to validate why I should be a pastor over you. No, but what James says is, James says, I am a servant. Hallelujah. Stay with me. Why does he do that? James calls himself a servant. 
Why? Because he's humble enough to realize earthly credentials are never accredited in the kingdom. Let me say it again. Are y'all with me this morning? Our earthly credentials, help me Holy Spirit, are never accredited in the kingdom. In other words, we learn from James's greeting that everyone in the kingdom is a servant. I said everyone in the kingdom is a servant. It doesn't matter your family. All right, I'm going to get in trouble now. Your education, your status, your money, your church office, or your gift. When we come to know Jesus as Savior, we all have one title that is recognized in the kingdom. Are you ready? Here it is. Servant. You may have a different office. You may have a different gift. And yes, those offices in the church need to be respected. And yes, those gifts need to be stewarded well. But at the end of the day, the kingdom does not look at you. And God is not going to look at us and say, well done, well done, good and faithful pastor. He's not going to say, well done, good and faithful prophet. He's not going to say, well done, good and faithful musician. Well done, good and faithful singer. Well done, good and faithful teacher. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Can I, can I go deeper on this? Are y'all going to rock with me today? I got a wrong way to go, but I, I pray for pray your patience. But 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 I, I think we need to be careful. And I, you've heard me say this before, but let me say this as your pastor. Pastor Pulpit. We need to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of thinking that the only way we can serve the Lord is if we got a title. As if to say, where we are is a stepping stone until we have a title attached to our name. Too many people fall into the trap of thinking that we're not serving or we're not being used by God until we get a title. We, 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 we keep mixing corporate and kingdom. We, 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 we're, we're mixing titles with tears. T-I-E-R-S. Corporate tears. Too many people think that ministry only happens in the pulpit, but you cannot be further from the truth. God says when we come into the kingdom, we all are servants. Yes, different offices. Yes, different gifts. But in here, God is calling all of us servant. Amen? And while we are on the subject, let's talk about what a servant is. That word servant is essentially means to be a bond servant. It means that the servant has no ownership or rights or privileges of his own, but he belongs to the person that bought him. Now, when we hear this, especially as black people, we, we get trigger words. We say, wait a minute. Because we other we begin to think about what our ancestors went through, but that's not what this is. Right. Amen. Let the church say amen. amen. That's not what this is. But we were redeemed by our Savior. The Bible says we were bought with a price. Our lives are not our own. When Jesus died, he rescued us from sin, adopted us into his family, and brought us into his kingdom by the blood of Jesus. And now we live to serve him. Notice in verse 1, he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord. Let the church say Lord. Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. That word Lord means a master. In other words, watch this. Here's the hard part. And here's why I'm telling you, you need to apply this for your life. The, the, we, we, we must understand that Jesus is not just the savior of our lives, saving our souls, but he is also the master of our lives, meaning he has authority to tell us what to do. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Jesus did not just come to save your soul, but he came to exercise authority over our lives for our ultimate good and his glory. All right. So Psalm 23, which is widely a widely known passage of scripture that everybody knows, there was a beautiful relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. The shepherd's job is to lead, protect, and provide. The sheep's job is to follow, trust, and obey. Watch this. If the shepherd does not lead, protect, and provide, the sheep cannot follow, and trust, and obey. If the sheep do not follow, trust, and obey, the shepherd cannot lead, protect, and provide. And it's the same with our relationship with Christ. If, God, if we are not, uh, if we are not uh, 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 following, trusting, and obeying, then God cannot lead, protect, and provide. And when we are submitted to the Lordship of Jesus, Jesus Christ, we are assured that whatever he tells us to do, wherever he asks us to go, he is going to lead us, he is going to protect us, he is going to provide for us. But the only way he can do that is if you follow, trust, and obey. Am I making sense? Let me give you an example because I got to move on. I got a lot to get to. There is a Christian rapper, goes by the name of KB, very excellent rapper, but he has this podcast called Southside Rabbi. 
I suggest you take a listen to it. Southside Rabbi, he lives in Florida, and he tells this story uh, about uh, how this, he has this game with his son. Uh, and what he does is, uh, to keep his son occupied, He'll tell his son, he says, son, uh, go touch that stop sign, right? He'll just give him random orders to do just to keep them going. And so he'll say, son, give me 10 jumping jacks. And they'll be in the middle, middle of Walmart. And then you see this little boy just doing jumping jacks. And he'll say, son, give me five push-ups. And he'll go give five push-ups. Run over there, run back, and you got 10 seconds. Stuff like that. Well, this particular moment, they're outside. They just walked out the door. And he says, son, go run to that stop sign. And he runs full speed to the south side. Now, at the time when the when the when KB the rapper gave the uh, gave the order, uh, the, there were no cars coming around. The stop sign is on is across the street. And he said, "All right, yeah, it was probably bad for me to do that, but I did it." And he didn't see any cars, so the boy was running straight for the stop sign. But lo and behold, as the sun was running, a car was coming. And so immediately, as soon as he saw the car, he yelled at the top of his lungs, "Stop!" And his son stopped immediately. His point was this. If my son didn't learn how to obey me, my son would have gotten hurt. It's the same with you. Anytime God tells you to do something, it's for his glory and for your good. It's to protect you. It is, and so though you may feel, God, I'm tired of submitting. I'm tired of doing this and doing that. And, but let God order your steps and your stops. Because you don't know what God is protecting you from. Hallelujah. God will keep you if you trust him. Amen. We are servants of Jesus living in submission to his lordship. Now, and as wonderful as it is to be a servant, it's not always easy. Now, let's get to the people he's talking to. James, the servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Pastor, who are the dispersion? Well, he says to the 12 tribes. James, brother, half-brother of Jesus, is a Jew. You see this throughout the scripture. You're going to see him say brother and over and over again throughout this letter. He's a Jew. And, and James is talking to his kinfolk. He's talking to his people. These people are literal blood sons of blood sons and daughters of Abraham. So is James. They are all uh, 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 descendants of the tribe, uh, 12 tribes of Israel. But James is a little different from the everyday Jew. Because James believes in his older brother, Jesus, as Savior. So if you will, you have your, your Bible version, your not Bible version, but the first Jews for Jesus. Uh-huh. He, he is a Jew and he believes in Jesus. Now, what is the diaspora? Again, the diaspora, it means scattered seed. Uh, Pastor, what does that mean? Here it is. It essentially means that these people that he's talking to do not live in their native land. Right. What is the native land? Jerusalem, Judah. They have been kicked out. Uh, uh, in Acts, can I give you a quick history lesson? Real quick. I got to do a lot of background so, you can, so I can get where I'm going. Acts chapter 2. Uh, it's the day that the church is born. Holy Spirit falls. It is the sign of the new covenant that the church is no longer replaced, but it is a people. And so the Holy Spirit is dwelling in people. People are speaking in tongues and be, being evidence that the church is now here. God lives in us. And then 120 people receive the Holy Spirit and the church continues to grow from then on. Peter preached the first sermon. He said, they say, what shall we do? He says, repent and believe and the church grows. Fast forward to Acts chapter 8. Saul the rabbi, the one who will become, saw, uh, become Paul the apostle. He's ravaging the church. And what happens to the church? The church scatters. So everybody was in Jerusalem. Everybody leaves. Because the church was being persecuted. Well, those people that were being persecuted, they are now leaving Jerusalem and they're going to, uh, to Palestine over Roman rule. So they literally say, we can't stay here, but we have to go to a foreign land. All right, all right. They are exiles in a foreign land. They have been pushed out. They are no longer living where they want to, where they're supposed to live. They are exiles living in a foreign land. Now, Pastor, what is the similarity between them living in a foreign land and us living here and, and us? Well, here it is. You too are an exile in a foreign land. All right. The, 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 you too are an exile in a foreign land. Pastor, what are you talking about? You talking about in America? No, I'm talking about the world. <laughs> What do you mean? You, you must understand, as believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, yes. this is not our home. Amen. Help me, Holy Spirit. We, we, we are just sojourners passing through. We are waiting for our true home. 
home. Where is that, Pastor? In heaven. This, this is not our home. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3 says, Let not your hearts be troubled. This is Jesus talking. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? That place is what? Home. It is heaven. Pastor, what's your point? My point is this. Stop trying to get comfortable here. Amen. Stop, stop trying to get comfortable here in this world. If you're trying to figure out why nothing in this world will satisfy, it's because it's never meant to satisfy you. This world is not your home. There is nothing that this world can offer you to satisfy your longing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You will never be comfortable in this world. Jesus is the only one that can satisfy your soul. And heaven is the only place that you can call home. Are you hearing me? C.S. Lewis, a, a, a Christian apologist, wrote this. Late Christian apologist wrote this. Most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do not want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that have offers, but they never quite keep their promise. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Pastor, what's your point? C.S. Lewis is simply saying this. This world will never satisfy. Pastor, give me some examples. I will. Have you ever tried to realize why is it that all the billionaires in the world have the most money, have everything they want, and they still end up depressed? Have you ever wondered why people are in, are in a relationship that you envy and yet you're still trying to figure out why they're sad? Have you ever looked at people and you said, you got everything that I would like, but every time I see you, you're sad about it. Why? Because none of those things are meant to satisfy you. Nothing in this world will satisfy but Jesus. And the only home that's made for you is heaven. Let the church say amen. 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 Now, we, we, will, we will never be comfortable in this world. We are exiles living in a foreign land, but we're also outcasts to society. Now, I, gotta, I, gotta, I want to move quickly because I've already, I don't have a lot of time left. But here, here's, here's, we already know about the Jewish Christians. They are in Palestine. But there are people waiting for them when they get there. Help me, Holy Spirit. All right. Who are the people waiting for them when they get there? You have to understand that when they went to Palestine, this wasn't an empty land. This wasn't them showing up and saying, all right, we got a new spot. Right. Fresh start. Ain't nobody here. We can build. No, no, no. Somebody has already occupied that land. Okay. Yeah. Pastor, who's occupied that land? Two groups. Now, stay with me. The Gentiles and the Jews. The Gentiles and the Jews. Gentiles are simply people that don't believe in Jesus. That's what, how they, the Bible uh, defines them. They just don't believe in Jesus. They have their own gods. They have their own practices. They live in debauchery, sin, and everything in between. However, the Jews are a different story. Stay with me because this is going to get a little complicated, so stay with me. The Jews are descendants. All right, let me, let me go back. Let me go back. Y'all remember the book of Nehemiah? Y'all remember last week we talked about the book of Nehemiah and how Nehemiah had to build the wall and because the, because the temple and the wall were destroyed and, and, the, and, and, um, and it was because of the disobedience of the Israelites and the people and the, uh, of God said you will be exiled out of Jerusalem. This is not the first time that they've been exiled or scattered. Well, this time, well, the people, well what happened was they were uh, exiled out of, Mount, out of Judah and some of them went to Babylon, stay with me, but some of them actually escaped to Egypt. They took Jeremiah with them. That's 2 Kings 25. And so what happens is the people that escaped from, uh, from Babylon, they ran, ran to Egypt. And watch this. They stayed there. While people from Babylon came back, the Israelites came back, there were a group of people that stayed right here in the Palestine area and remained Jews. They never came back. These people that are occupying that place in that James is talking about, those are the people that are there around the Jewish Christians. Are you with me? So you have Jews up here that are, have, that are descendants of the, the fathers and mothers of Nehemiah's time. And then you have Gentiles. Now here's the problem. Are you still with me? You have the Jewish Christians who believe in Christ. But they don't fit in with the Gentiles because they don't believe in Jesus. However, at the same time, they don't, put, they don't fit in with their own kinfolk because they're, now mind you, they're regular Jews.
Jews. And so therefore, they're looking at them and say, we still believe in the Torah. We still believe in uh, our father Moses and Abraham. We don't believe in Jesus and the Messiah has not yet come. And so they can't fit in with the Jews because the Jews won't accept them. But they can't fit in with the Gentiles because the Gentiles won't accept them. They are outcasts to society. Are you hearing me? But, and can you imagine the heartbreak of the Jewish Christians because they have no friends, but then they see their Jewish brother and say, hey man, the Torah says, love your neighbor as yourself. If I need something to eat, you're supposed to feed me. All right. And they said, get away from me. I don't want nothing to do with you because you are a sellout to your people. All right. All right. You're not going to help. We don't want to help you and we don't want nothing to do with you. And so now, not only are they exiles, but they are outcasts. Nobody wants to be with them. They don't fit in anywhere. Have you ever felt like that? It just seems like the, that the moment you gave your life to Jesus Christ, it just seems like you became the odd man out. Yeah. Oh man, y'all gonna help me preach. Uh, 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 it just seems like, you know, that when you gave your life to Christ, now you, you, everybody go to the club and they leave you home. Y'all not going to be honest with me. You, you, you used to be the first to take them shots, but now you, you asking for soda. Y'all going to act, if we going to be a church of discipleship, we got to be real. I, I, you used to be the first to do everything, but now it just seems like I'm the outcast because I believe in Jesus. I used to be able to relate with people, but now it just seems like I'm talking Jesus and they're not. I used to laugh at some things that are inappropriate, but it's not funny anymore. People are saying you changed, and I'm like, yeah, I have changed because I gave my life to Christ. Have you ever felt that way? If so, it's okay. You're in good company. When you believe in Jesus, you're not going to fit in because you stand on the word of God. You stand on his word, and the people of the world are not going to be able to relate with you because your philosophies are different. Your lifestyle is different. Everything about you is different. Why? Because you stand on the word of God. Unfortunately, I hate to tell you this, but you're not going to fit in. But don't be dismayed. Don't be upset. Because you must realize... You're, you're, you're not so much an outcast, so forgive me for calling you that. You're not an outcast, but what you really have, what really has taken place is you've changed positions. You're no longer a follower, you're a leader now. Stay with me. You see, the people of Israel were supposed to be the representatives of God on earth. They were supposed to represent the kingdom of God wherever they want. That was what the people of Israel are meant to do, and that is what we are meant to do. We are supposed to be the leaders. We are supposed to be the example. We are supposed to be the people that show people the way to Christ. And so though you may say, I, I feel like an outcast person. No, you're not an outcast. You're the leader now. Hallelujah. I know you used to be, you used to feel like I was in the crowd. I was with everyone. That's because you were a follower. But now that you are a leader, it's going to feel like you're the anomaly. Hallelujah. I feel my help. I feel like that nobody else is with you, but that's because you My, my family and I, we, we took a trip to, uh, to Florida, and uh, we got in the TSA line. And obviously, you know TSA line, but I don't like TSA. I mean, God bless them. I know they keep the security. I can, I need it. Thank you. But golly, when you get there, it's like, you know, just, it's it's crazy. But we're in the TSA line, and of course, before you uh, take off your socks, your shoes, and all your clothes, uh, you, you have to, uh, you show your ID and your ticket. And we were in line, and it was a pretty long line, and my brother remembers, the TSA guy, he kind of said it, but there was so much going on, you can't hear it. He said, uh, there was a long line, it was backed up, and he said, you can go to the other line, there's a TSA worker open. Now, mind you, people are scared, they're like, I don't want to go, because if I go, what if they put me in the back of the line, I miss my flight, I don't want no problems. And my brother looked at me, and he said, go on to the next one. And my brother has this thing, he, my brother doesn't like, he calls them sheeple. Sheeple. And what happens is it means that everybody, they do things based on what everyone else is doing. They don't actually listen, brother Nate. They just, whatever, what are they doing? Then I'm going to go do that. But, but my brother said, go to the other line. So we went to the other line. And for 30 seconds, we looked crazy. I feel my help. For 30 seconds, we looked like we did something unorthodox. For 30 seconds, it looked like we were weird. But then when people started to see, it actually worked. Then everybody else started following the line. I wish you would see where I'm going. My point is this. As you are a leader for Christ, you are meant to show people there is another way. I know when you look crazy for a little bit, but keep on looking crazy because you're going to find out that people are going to say, I didn't know there was another way. I didn't know there was another way to live. I didn't know there was another way to live my life. Keep 
you believe that, say amen. 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 It's all right to be awkward. Hallelujah. I'm done. Thank you for your patience. Jewish Christians are living in a foreign land. They're outcasts. But they're at war on every side. Everything around them is screaming, turn to sin, forget Christ. They're tempted on every side. They're tempted by the world, tempted by the people. They're tempted in the flesh. They, to the right, when they walk down the street, you get false god, uh, false gods and temple prostitutes. Uh, to the left, you get witchcraft and, and uh, witchcraft and, and uh, um, if you will, uh, fake prophets all around. And to make matters worse, believe it or not, uh, 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 they, they are severely oppressed. Remember, they moved to Palestine. They are in a place that they don't like. They are around people uh, that don't like them. And what happens is, what they are doing is the people know who they are, so they are oppressing them. The Gentiles are, then the Jews are the ones that run the town. And so when the Christian Jew says, hey, I need a room, can you help me? They say, okay, hold on, we got a list. But then another person that comes in is a Gentile or a Jew, depending on who the person who runs the place. They say, we have a room just for you. But I've been waiting in line. No, I, 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 no, I want this guy because they've been oppressed. They literally are looked over. They can't get a house. If they do get a house, their interest payment is, is skyrocketed versus the person that's been a Gentile. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When they need to get a job, they are more qualified for the job, but they are overlooked. Why? Because of because they're Christian. All because of the fact that they believe in Jesus. They are hit on every side. They are homeless. They are fighting for their lives. And to be honest with you, I feel like the biggest thing that they're tempting with, being tempted with, is what we deal with all the time. And you may not agree, but maybe you will secretly. They're being tempted to give up. Yeah. Stay with me and I'm done. You have to understand that they're being tempted to say, you know what? This whole Jesus thing, it's causing more harm than good. You have to remember, the reason why they were kicked out of, uh, of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2 was because they were Christians. The reason why they are outcasts is because they believe in Jesus. The reason why they ain't got no friends is because they believe in Jesus. It seems like everything around them is because of the fact they believe in Jesus. Uh, you know, they're probably saying to themselves, I was good until I got to this Christ thing. I was fine until I started to confess this Jesus. You know, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm done with it. And I, and I say this, uh, I say this to you and I'm, I'm almost in my seat. I don't care how long you believed in Jesus. I don't care how long you've been in the church. I don't care how long you've claimed to walk with the Lord. We've all had a temptation every now and again to say I'm ready to give up. We've all had a temptation that says, you know what? Even if it was for a second, we'd say, you know, I'd probably be a little better if I didn't come to church on Sunday. At least I can lay in the bed and sleep a little longer. Y'all not going to talk to me because you don't want to be honest. I'll be honest. There are some days I'm to can somebody else preach. I'll be transparent if you won't. <laughs> is that, is that, can we do something else? Because it seems like the more I do this, the worse life gets. Some of us are saying, I'm not just done, Pastor. I'm overdone. <laughs> I quit. I surrender. I'm waving the right flag. I'm tired of fighting. What do you do when everything around you is saying, throw in the towel? What do you do, Pastor? Here's my advice to you, and I pray that you stay come next week for the series. You need to hold on, man. Don't give up. And I know you're saying, Pastor, that's easy for you to say. No, hear me. Don't give up because... You, you, how else will you see what God is doing in your life? What do you mean by that? I want you to stay right there. Go on, we don't, we're not going anywhere. But look where it says, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. You remember what I said the definition of the diaspora was or dispersion? Scattered seed. Y'all remember? It means scattered seed. Pastor, what are you getting at? Because it seems like they are dealing with issues that are out of control. They're, they're, it, 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 because seed uh, 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 don't scatter on their own. Seeds are thrown. Yes, yes. Stay with me. Seeds are not scattered. Seeds don't just fall out of the sky. Somebody has to throw them in order for them to be scattered. And it feels like all these random things are happening out of nowhere. It seems like
like the circumstances are out of control, or maybe I can talk to you. It seems like your life is out of control. Your circumstances are out of control. It seems like all these things are happening, happening randomly, but I argue that these things are not happening randomly. You are not being scattered, but you are being purposely planted. You have not been randomly thrown, but you have been purposely placed to bear fruit. Watch me. Could it be? And I suggest to you that maybe God has allowed these situations to take place in your life so that you can bear the fruit that he wants you to bear. Seeds are planted to bear fruit. Watch me. Could it be that God has allowed these situations to take place so that you can draw closer to him? Could it be? I know it's not popular, but it's the Bible. Could it be that God has allowed those things so that you would pray more? Could it be that God has allowed those things because he wants to draw you closer? Could it be that God has allowed these things because he wants you to bear fruit? Pastor, give me scripture to back it up. In the second verse, James says, count it all joy when you face trials of various kinds. For you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. The Lord is growing your faith. And though you feel like all these things are happening randomly, no, I encourage you, hold on, child of God. God's going to see you through. Thank you, Jesus. Hold on, child of God. God's going to see you through. Hold on to his word. God is growing you. Keep on praying. God is holding you. God is growing you. Don't go in the towel yet. Because you got to see how God is finished. How God's going to finish up his work. I'm in my seat. I told this story before, and as I'm getting ready for work, I know I'm getting ready to deal with this child again. Yes, sir. Lord, y'all pray for your pastor. Right. Get ready to deal with this child again. There's this one child who every uh, every time and uh, when we get to school, he loves to play with the Legos because he loves to build. Very bright child. He bad, but he very bright. Very smart. And he always wants to build cars. That's his thing. Uh, and so we give him Legos. He builds up the car. And he takes, I mean, he takes his time. And for a five-year-old, he's very smart. And he says, this is the rudder. This is the, the four wheels. This is four-wheel drive. And I'm like, how do you even know what all-wheel drive is? But whatever. He know. I mean, he and I'll put down. I'm like, this is a car. He goes, no, it's a truck. Okay? Like, and like he, everything is properly said. And of course, lo and behold, after he builds, it's been about 15 minutes, and he builds this car. And the hardest part is putting the car, the Legos, away. Because he's been building, and it's probably my fault. Because usually when it's time to put it away, I don't like say, "Okay, here you go." I usually go, "All right, cool," you know. So I like kind of throw it. Y'all pray for me. But but so it's time to throw it away, and he goes, "No," and he's hollering, and I'm like, "Come on, man, it's Friday. Like, let's can we just go home?" And and he's and he's hollering, and he's upset. And 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 I said, "Well, why do you? How come I can't put the labels away?" Now nah, I'm getting frustrated. How come? I, he says, "Because I'm not finished yet." What's your point, Pastor? Many of you in here came in here and said, I want to give up. And God is saying, you can't give up. I'm not finished yet. God has been working on you. God has been building you up. You have seen some things that you didn't think you were supposed to, that you would never see. You are dealing with things you thought you would never survive. The, because you're trying to figure out how is my mind still stable. And what you are finding out is that you're growing in Christ. And God says, if you throw in the towel, you will never see what the complete work that I'm trying to do in you. God says, I'm not finished yet. Don't give up. Hold on a little while longer, child of God. Because God is making you to who he wants you to be. God is growing you to be the woman of God you're supposed to be. God is growing you to be the man of God he wants you to be. Don't, don't throw in the towel. And if you hold on a little while longer, you'll, you'll grow. I know you feel like an exile in a foreign land. I know you feel like you are an outcast. But while you're doing it, you God is growing you. So I encourage you, keep walking with him. Keep trusting him. Keep reading his word. Remember, the world cannot satisfy you. Remember, you are the leader. And remember that all things work together. Even in your trials, trust the Lord while you're in the middle of the dispersion. Amen? Amen. We want to invite, invite you to know Christ as your Savior. A couple of things that we need to do here is simple. is that uh, you need, We need to confess our sins. Uh, uh, confess and say, Lord, I have sinned in my life. 
and I need that sin removed. And the only way that that sin can be removed is when we confess that Jesus is Lord, that he died for our sins, and he was resurrected and is seated at the right hand of the Father. So you simply just need to say, Lord, I have sins. Forgive me for those sins. I receive you as Savior, and I believe by faith that you are Lord and that you are the Lord of my life and you have redeemed me from my sins. And just like that, you have salvation. Just like that, you know the Lord for yourself. Uh, one thing that we've learned, uh, and, and we know at Union here at our church, uh, uh, we would uh, uh, we would love for you to be a part of our church. But at the same time, um, if you wish to go to another church or you want uh, uh, know someone else, that's fine too. But one thing is certain, and, and uh, you don't have to be here to be saved. Uh, you know the Lord for yourself. So uh, if you have any uh, questions or concerns, I would uh, advise you to go to our email. Uh, our email is unionbaptist.southriverNJ at gmail.com. That's unionbaptist.southriverNJ at gmail.com.